I hate organic chemistry. It's impossible. Organic chemistry? Ew. These are some common reactions to the subject of organic chemistry. And that's not really surprising, considering how difficult the subject can actually be. When students learn organic chemistry, they don't only learn new subject matter, but they also learn a new language to go along with the subject matter. This new language often contains symbolism that is unfamiliar and non-intuitive to most people. If we can take this symbolism and make it more relatable, people would be able to understand the symbolism a little bit better and maybe eventually the stigma of organic chemistry being a very hard course will go away just a little bit. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to try to do with you all today. If you've ever picked up a plastic water bottle, used detergent on your clothes or your dishes, if you've ever worn makeup or taken medication, you have encountered an application of organic chemistry. The thing that all of these products have in common are molecules that contain carbon atoms. And organic chemistry is defined as the study of carbon-containing compounds. It wasn't always defined in this way. People used to think that organic compounds actually had to come from living sources. It wasn't until the mid-1800s where this theory of vitalism, where the living sources would transfer this vital force to the organic molecules, was actually disproved. And a, a, an experiment was done where two inorganic molecules were combined. So these are molecules from non-living sources, and they produce an organic molecule. And that led to the normal definition of organic chemistry that we see today. Another breakthrough came in the early 1900s when chemists started to think about what exactly is going on between these molecules in a reaction. They knew that if they combined some molecules, they would get out some kind of product. Oftentimes, they wouldn't even know what the product would be used for. But in the 1900s, people started thinking, well, what's going on behind the scenes? How are these molecules reacting to make new molecules? And they found out that the key behind the reactions of organic compounds was a transfer of electrons. So electrons are the key movements that shift bonds around, form new molecules. And once this was discovered, people needed a way to communicate what these electron transfers were and to tell people there were these certain patterns that occur in these molecules. And it was then that a chemist named Robert Robinson ended up proposing arrow notation. So this is using arrows to show where electrons are flowing. And this is the focus of modern organic chemistry courses. Students usually learn reactions and all of these arrows to show what exactly these molecules are doing to produce the new product. So what do students typically know when they start organic chemistry, they're familiar with a little bit of this language. So organic chemistry is like learning a new language, and they do have some familiarity. This is like somebody coming into a language course knowing a few of the words, but they won't know how to make sentences, and they don't usually know how to make stories or how to write paragraphs, for example. So in organic chemistry, what we assume students know is that the molecules on the left-hand side of an arrow are the ones that we start with. The ones on the right-hand side of the arrow are our products. Those are the ones that end up. That reaction arrow in between, that's actually like an equal sign. In math would be where you're adding things on the left and getting your answer on the right. Another thing that students usually know coming into course is the fact that the dots around that BR, that bromine atom, those dots represent electrons, and they're usually found in pairs, and they usually travel in pairs. Not always, but this is usually the case. There are a couple things that students may or may not be familiar with when they start an organic chemistry course, and these are things like line structures. Organic chemists combine the atoms to make line structures in order to make it a little bit simpler to see what's going on. You can see the structure on the top is actually a lot more convoluted than the one on the bottom. And this, what we do in these line structures is we assume that the carbon atoms are at every point. So every end will be a carbon atom and in the middle will be a carbon atom. Hydrogen atoms are assumed. So this is something that we teach in organic chemistry as well. It's part of the language. 
Another thing students might, might or might not already know is that plus and the minus sign. The minus sign refers to the fact that that atom has a little bit more electrons than it normally wants to have. And the plus sign means that the atom has a little bit less electrons than it normally wants to have. And these are the key behind how reactions happen. So what organic chemistry is all about, we kind of review these concepts, and then we go into the main part of the language, which is the arrow notation. So this was developed by Ro Robinson in 1922, and this is what we're still teaching today to show how molecules react. There are a couple of patterns to the way that we show these arrows, and this is sort of like teaching students a few sentences that they can start stringing together to make paragraphs in, for example, a language course. So the few sentences are the bond formation. So we usually start at the source of electrons, that those two dots, that lone pair. That is our source, and we point towards the atom that will end up in the bond. We can also have bonds as our source of electrons, and in that case, we do a very similar motion in order to make a new bond. The other key aspect to showing how molecules react is to break bonds, because molecules reacting are all forming bonds and breaking bonds. And so breaking bonds, we start our arrow in the middle of the bond, and we point to the atom that gets the electrons. When we put it like this, it seems like there's some nice foundation to start with, but this language is not very intuitive to most people, and most students coming in struggle to learn this language. And about a year ago, a student by the name of Maria Thomas approached me with an idea to relate this electron flow to the human behavior. And so what we did were our goal was to try to make this electron flow a little bit more relatable to how people react. So bonds are like bonds between people. We're going to see a little bit more about this in a bit. So the reaction that we decided to start with was a common reaction for organic chemistry courses, for introductory organic chemistry. So this is a reaction that students usually learn. It's usually uh, pretty difficult because there are some trends that are a little bit reversed in this one um, versus what they normally see. So this is an example of what we show students. And we expect them to look at this and remember how it goes. And they're sitting there thinking that this is what it pretty much relates to. <laughs> Probably like some of you are thinking that was a lot of jumbled mess, did not make any sense of it. So the students will usually see this and they're asking questions semester after semester. As an undergraduate, I had the exact same questions. How do those atoms end up attached that way? This is a very difficult reaction to learn. So what we did is we related the chemical behavior in this reaction to human behavior, and we told a story of this reaction. We personalized the atoms a little bit, and Maria did this by making videos. So the key concept in this reaction is something called electronegativity. Electronegativity is how much an atom hogs the electrons in the bond. So the line between the carbon and the magnesium is two electrons. The red arrow is pointing towards the carbon because the carbon actually hogs most of the electrons in that bond. So in a way, it's like it has this burden. And just like personalities of people and their relationships, this is like one partner in the relationship having all the responsibility, having a lot of stress that's not going to be the greatest for that relationship. Just like th this uh, electronegativity difference isn't the greatest for that bond. So we re-examined the same reaction, and we went stepwise and explained this in terms of human behavior. So the main characters, or key atoms, are colored. And we start off with our carbon-magnesium bond. So the red person and the blue person. The red person is a little bit stressed out. It has more of the burden in that relationship. But that's OK until another molecule comes along. Chemically, this is how we show that. And what happens is the carbon leaves the magnesium with the electrons to go and bond to a different carbon. Structurally, we show this like this, where we have a line between the green carbon and the red carbon. That's that new bond. So they're in a nice, happy relationship. Carbon and uh, carbon bonds, they're actually the same electronegativity, so they share the burden equally. It's a very healthy relationship. It's not going to go back. 
So magnesium, though, he's left all by himself. He's not the only one who got screwed over in this reaction, though. Soon as the red carbon attacked the green carbon, the oxygen also got dumped with more electrons. So it has this burden, it's not very happy, and the oxygen and magnesium form a relationship, a rebound. <laughs> we show that chemically with a line between the magnesium and the oxygen. And they, they sit like that for a while, they're fine, until another molecule comes along. Physically, what we do is we add acid into our reaction, and this provides hydrogen atoms. The pink oxygen loves the hydrogen atoms, and it's going to go and bond with one of those. Yet again, magnesium sitting there thinking, what's wrong with me? Why does this keep happening? <laughs> and the oxygen and the black hydrogen end up in a bond. We usually end up stopping our analysis of this reaction at this point because we only care usually with what happens to the organic material. But for the sense of closure, let's talk about what happens to this magnesium. <laughs> so when we added acid into the reaction, we also have water molecules. And one of these water molecules, the oxygen shown in orange, ends up through a little bit of a process binding to the magnesium and they live happily ever after in the chemical waste bin. <laughs> so let's summarize the bonds that we ended up forming in this reaction. So the red carbon ended up leaving the blue magnesium for the green carbon. The pink oxygen also left the blue magnesium for the black hydrogen. And the magnesium finally found its happy ending with the oxygen. Anecdotally, this has been shown to be helpful for students, and I hope you enjoyed this story of this chemical romance, and I hope you learned a little bit of organic chemistry along the way. Thank you.